This is a 3018 CNC router. They are all over eBay, Amazon and AliExpress. I've had it for a while and used it to make a load of things like this tiny drone, custom IO shields and a bunch of little parts of bigger projects. I run it inside this plastic box right on my desk. I had a few little accidents with it but it's worked pretty well otherwise. However it does have a very small work area and it's not very powerful. It will just about cut through aluminum but I'm always worried when I do that that I'm going to burn something out. I thought about a few upgrades, in particular adding limit switches and home switches so it's easier to set up, but since that would sacrifice even more work area, I figured I'd rather have something a little bit bigger and more powerful. I'm going to make something with roughly the same general plan as this. I'll have the tool on the z-axis, which moves on the x-axis, and the workpiece on the y-axis. On a milling machine, you tend to have the x and y-axis together on the table, and the z-axis separate, which is great for rigidity, but sacrifices work area. And on a gantry machine, you'd have the x, y and z-axis all attached to each other, and the workpiece stays still, which is great for maximising the available work area, but I think this 3018 design is a good compromise. One of the ways a 3018 machine works quite well, despite being made of low tolerance parts in places, is by being adjustable. The machine can be squared up by assembling it approximately square, loosening bolts on the fittings and then tighten it up again when it's square. This works because the majority of the machine is this 2020 aluminum extrusion and all of the fittings can slide along it. So as long as square is somewhere in the adjustment range, it's possible to make it square. I may use aluminum extrusion for some of the frame of this machine, but for parts that I want to be really rigid, I'm going to use aluminum plate. For example, the Z-axis I'm going to make today. If I have a part with clearance holes for two M5 bolts, and these have to be exactly in line. A normal clearance for an M5 bolt is 5.5 millimeters, but I know that my measuring and cuts might be out by say 0.2 millimeters, and I know that the parts I'm not making myself might also be out by say 0.2 millimeters. So worst case, we'd occur up with interference between the bolt and the clearance hole that we cut out for it. This could lead to the bolts not going in at all. Uh, it could lead to the bolts twisting the stock awkwardly, and that might lock up linear rail carriages. If I need more than two holes in a line, that error adds up even higher in theory. But practically, I'm not going to drill holes that are more than a few tenths of a millimeter off center, and the parts that I haven't made myself aren't that far off specifications. If I make the clearance holes for my bolt M6 instead, and use uh, washers or bolts with flat heads rather than countersunk bolts, then I should be able to measure and line up the holes and get the machine square. The idea here is, like the 3018 machine, to make sure the desired configuration lies within the space of possible configurations, rather than trying to cut holes to hundreds of a millimetre on a cheap drill press. These are most of the parts we're going to use today. This is an SFU1204 ball screw with a NEMA 23 motor mount, and these are SPR12 linear rails. And this combination of parts creates some design constraints that we'll talk through. First of all, this motor mount actually means that the motor sits slightly below where you consider the bottom of this to be. So this is in line with this, uh, but this is about this far lower. Um, we could raise this whole thing up. We could put a sort of shim underneath this to bring it all up to, to flat, or we could just hang this over the end of the material like this. Um, these rails, the carriages on them are very close to be in the same height as the carriage on the ball screw. They're not though. By spec, there's about three millimeters distance between the top of this carriage and the top of these carriages. Actually, it can measure a bit differently. I think it's about 2.5 here. Um, so we'll have to work out a way to bring these to the same height. Again, just by shimming between the layer that we put on top and uh, these, these parts. Uh, one other thing, these um, have little adjustment grub screws on the side and on the top and we're going to want to have access to those so that we can set the tension on these, set how they rotate relative to each other, actually sets how smoothly they, they slide. And one more thing, we're going to need to have access to this oiling nipple on the, uh, the ball screw so we don't want to have this like underneath the plate, we want to always be able to access this without having to take the machine apart. So what we're going to end up with is something a bit like this. and driven by the, uh, the NEMA 23 motor. I've built a simplified modelling FreeCAD with all of the important dimensions. This helped me get the layout right, 
helps you work out where all the bolt holes need to be and also make sure there's no interference between sliding parts and to see how much travel I end up with. I do actually lose a bit of travel on this ball screw. Uh, if, you, if I uh, move the carriage as far down as it will go on the rails, you'll see there's this bit of additional space where we could move on the ball screw here. If I was to use the full length of stock I've got, I might get a little bit more travel. Because this is a Z-axis and we only need to move a tool over the material, it's okay to sacrifice a bit of travel here. If I could actually get a shorter ball screw, I would, but this is the smallest one I can get in this size. Regarding the other constraints we talked about, I have the motor mount hanging over the edge of the plate. I have some washers to shim up the height of the um, ball screw carriage to match the height of the linear rail carriages. I have additional holes here to access the top grub screws on the linear rails and the side grub screws all point outwards. And I have access to the oiling nipple because it's here. It doesn't go underneath the surface of the plate. To make it as this design, I will have to cut a small amount off a large piece of stock I've got. Uh, I only really have one tool at the moment that can do that quickly and accurately, and it's a little um, brew. <laughs> To get the layout for drilling, I project each part into 2D, print these out onto A4 labels, uh, cut them down to size, uh, stick them to the stock, and then use that as a guide for punching and cutting the holes. I'm using this cheap drill press to cut the holes. I start with a centre drill as a pilot because these centre in the chuck more easily than a 1mm twist bit would, but the bits on this press can very easily jump off centre, whatever I do. I've played around for a long time trying to make it more precise, but for now I've just accepted it isn't particularly and I know how to work around it. I'm using this little compound table to move the stock around. This is more for convenience than any repeatability or accuracy. I only need to tap four holes in this. These are M6 holes with a spindle clamp. I'll mark up the bigger piece of stock to cut 20 millimeters from the end of it, just using a blue marker and these carbide tip glass marking pens and a set square. This bit of stock wasn't so cheap and this is more of an aesthetic cut than something truly required. So I'm a bit apprehensive about ruining the piece. This saw is a mitre drag saw with a mitre material blade, but you can't use the slide to push uh, a blade like this through aluminum. I've tried, it makes a horrible mess. So rather than that, I lock the blade in different positions and just do downward passes. Uh, it works fine, the piece comes out fine with a tiny bit of cleanup on the edge needed. Um, I would have been very annoyed if it hadn't, uh, considering this was just a cosmetic cut. I use the same approach with a printed label to get the layout and then punch and drill. Although I have to use two labels and carefully align them because the part is bigger than A4. Uh, one day I'll get some proper layout tools. I give both plates a quick sand and polish. I do skip a few grades of paper, which maybe I regret, but these aren't museum pieces and will probably get knocked around a fair bit. I needed 2.5mm thick washers to shim between the ball screw carriage and the linear rail carriage height. I found these big nylon washers that are 2.5mm thick, but they're much too big. And this isn't just a cosmetic thing, they're so big they won't fit next to each other. So I needed to cut them down a bit. I bolt them together and then use the head of the bolt to measure and fix run out. I used the carbide single point bit that I had installed from the last cut I did on this. It makes some nice chips, but mostly this long, tough single chip. I just let that happen and push it towards the chuck end. All but one of the washers came out perfectly. The last one just had a little bit of flashing on it that I filed off. Here is the finished assembly. I'm not going to attach the stepper motor today. I want to do the limit switches first and I've got a whole video planned on selecting and setting up limit switches. So for now I've just added this hex bolt to this flexible coupler here. I can turn it with an Allen key. You can see I can get all the way through the travel. If I can turn this easily with my fingers, it's going to be no problem for the stepper motor.